Okay, I'll get us started. So, uh, Ben, welcome. Um, since this is your first call, I'll let you know that we record and publish these so that other users and folks who are trying to catch up on what we're doing can um, take a look at those videos just so you know. But this is uh, Using Query May 4, 2020. Um, and we use these calls typically to uh, understand the issues, ideas, bugs, features that our users who um, have tried query are interested in um, or you know stories that they've encountered by using the software things like that so we definitely want to make sure that um, what's on your mind is something we discussed today yes and may the fourth be with all of you <laughs> um, Holger's been on a couple of these calls so I think we can um, make sure that whatever's on the top of your mind Holger as well is at the, the front of the agenda um, otherwise beef I was going to say that the RFCs that we updated and punched up today would be the kind of the third thing. Did everyone, um, and I know this is like just a query team member specific thing, but did most folks have a chance to look at the feedback Ben gave? I can resurface it. Um, or Ben, you can tell us a little bit about your first impressions of downloading query after you met us at the uh, um, School of Data event in March. Yeah, so I was, I was in that workshop, I was able to get kind of a good overview, I think, of a lot of some of the basic functionality um, through the demonstration. I think the one thing I've been most curious about, and I think I've, I kind of mentioned that in my letter was just kind of, I think coming to it from less of a programming side, um, there's certain functionalities, which I think I, I draw similarities to uh, just using things like Git or GitHub um, and kind of like understanding what, what things will function the same based off of what you understand about those platforms versus what things are a little bit different. Like I know, for example, it took me, um, and this was in part, I think it might've been explained better in the workshop, but when I was first just since I, it, about a month, I think had passed since I had, jumped back into it. Um, like when you when you hit the clone button on a data set, uh, and this was in part because I was looking at, um, I saw Chris had published his turnstile data for the New York City subway. So I was interested in taking a look at some of that data. So I cloned it and I saw that it was like down in my system, but then I was trying to figure out, well, where is the where did the actual file go? Um, because when you're cloning from, when I clone something from GitHub, it clones it to your local machine. So it's, it, from that I was able to kind of like figure out the path of like, okay, so you have to go to the, I think it's the history tab. Um, and then you, I, I noticed that there's that note that says that if you want to access the data that you have to right click and then export it to a file. Um, and then you're able to kind of get the CSV out of the system and which then you can access the data. So I think there's some things like that where it's at least based off of kind of your, I guess, like preconceived notion of how you're expecting it to work can be a little bit challenging. And that's also just too that I wasn't sure if there was a way that, because I know there, there had been discussion around the, the CLI, which I'm less familiar with, but like whether or not there's ways that you can when you um, clone a data set, are there ways you can interact with that data directly as it's stored within query as opposed to having to export it? Um, because especially as things that are, as data gets uh, updated, in most cases you just want to pull down the, or you just want to continually um, re-pull the data and just be accessing that same data set. So, there's, there's some functionality like that, which I, I haven't had time to necessarily go more into documentation, but have was kind of curious about. And I think some of the other some of the other comments I had were just, I guess, thinking about the platform from a from my background working in like a nonprofit around city planning, in which case I think that looking at the tool, there seems to be a lot of potential in terms of solving a lot of the issues you would face with teams working around 
working with the same data sets and not having and being able to clear, quickly see like, oh, this person fixed this issue because you would normally have situations where five different people would be working on the same data sets and each person had fixed certain things about their own copy of the data set, but those changes never sometimes didn't always flow back into one master file unless there was a real coordinated effort to do so. So I could definitely see tools like this being useful um, when you, if you have the ability to um, kind of share or have multiple contributors on a file, which seems like, I know, I think I mentioned that before and I think it was something that the team had mentioned that was a, an interest in um, adding that feature. But I think that's also something too where Again, when you when you start to draw the comparisons between Git, it's kind of like a noticeable. Like you assume, like you assume it would just have that feature because it's 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 operating on a similar model, but it it does like it doesn't. And I think that there's there's also some ways in which query kind of has its own unique functions that are better than what you get with Git in terms of dealing with data sets, which it can be good, both good and bad with managing a data set that way. Um, so I think it's just at least initially kind of navigating some of those, some of those issues. Or I guess like navigating issues and also or just kind of like your expectations about what, what you can do with the platform. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining Ben and giving us this feedback. It's like really, no, sure. this, is, this is the actual intended purpose of this call. <laughs> we call it the using query call and this is like the point. <laughs> um, so uh, it's delightful. Um, does anybody want to pick up with stuff that resonated? I know a million things resonated with me, but I'm sure others may have some, some reactions. Um, I don't, obviously there's a lot of specific things, but I just, it's really sort of gratifying to hear that someone comes to the project and sees the potential in it, the way that we have thought about certain things, which is, again, super, super gratifying. Um, I'm sure there are things that Brendan can go into more specifics, but um, hearing you see the potential in uh, group collaboration, I think is something that we're all like really excited about as a as like a, a goal for the project. And um, just that it's it's pretty fun that uh, one of the things you mentioned was cloning and checkout and comparisons to Git. And I know that that's like a big conversation we're gonna have today with, with certain aspects of our like language and CLI and how we talk about things. So I don't know, it's just like a, a really good, uh, really good start to the call about what we wanted to end up actually talking about today. So I just thought it was cool. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, I think it also pairs really nicely with the discussion that was happening in Discord around the idea of like, just give us a download link, uh, like like a regular download link. It's like an onboarding point. Because clearly like you spent a bunch of time downloading query desktop, just trying to find your way to like a, you know, right click on a version to get it into, you know, a format that you're used to. Um, and uh, while, yeah, and I think that that's like something that we have to do uh, more clearly and, uh, and, and like really work out a more, simplistic system to work for. You touch on a lot of things. There's a lot to sort of digest. Um, yeah, Rusty. I have some more comments on the read-only thing that I was didn't get into typing into general. But you could have a user who's read-only forever. I mean, if you have no use for, for editing the data, you could still be a read-only user and never set up an account because you don't need one and add a huge amount to query because every time you publish something and link to the source, it goes back to query.cloud. And you may never, I mean, you would know that person's name from their blog post or their tweets or whatever, but you may never see that person with an account on query cloud if you make it easy enough to get the data out. And if they're afraid of the command line or as good as the desktop app is, they already know how to click a link and download the data. You know, that would make it harder for them. And um, you know, if you don't mind coughing up the bandwidth and avoiding IPFS, um, you could have a user that, and that would 
add tremendous value to query as a company, not really as a community necessarily, and never have an account at all. And as an analog to GitHub, you know, when I was talking about downloading zips before I ever did Git clone, um, as an analog to that, you could have somebody who really liked a piece of software that they got off of GitHub, never set up an account, either Git clone or download a zip, use it, be a huge fan, but not be a contributor because they don't know how to write C sharp or Java or whatever. And both GitHub and that project get a bunch of inbound links. You agree. Anybody else? First thoughts? There's Ben mentioned a bunch of stuff. Um, the thing that uh, stood out to me is definitely an area where we need to improve, which is, you know, we, we have this problem we keep coming back to where we have kind of a database like model like Postgres where data sets go to. Um, you know, I, in an ideal world, uh, it would be obvious that the way that once you get the files in your machine, you can see them by checking them out. Like, that's, there's like a lot of functionality around that. Um, it, 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 it keeps a lot of power that query has where you can still make changes and then like, like see the history of all that. Um, uh, it's clearly like a UI thing that we're not uh, doing correctly if it like isn't the obvious way to work with it. Um, uh, yeah, like um, Ben, you were talking about like right clicking and exporting, which is another way to get the data, but um, we have this, this, this version where you have like a Git style checkout uh, once, the, the, once you have added the data set from cloud. Um, so yeah, there's some interesting UI questions around like how, we, how do we make that, uh, how do we push users towards that? Ben, I think you also like really seem to touch upon this, like the, this interplay with Git in a nuanced way, this idea that like we have like we built the checkout to make it work more like Git, but as you said, I think you made a point that it's really strong and, and important to sort of address directly here, which is like there are places where we match Git and then everywhere where we don't match Git, it's a, it's a frustration because if you come from the, from the world of Git and, it, and we don't have like my biggest, my personal version of this is like we don't have Git save amend and like I constantly amend commits in Git and it's just like the way that I use it. And every time we don't have it, I'm like, Rawr. Um, and, and then on the other side, we have places where we go past Git and, and like um, Asner, who's not on the call, really kind of fundamentally doesn't believe that we should be talking about Git a lot um, as the way that we operate, even though we still have a lot of language from Git. And I don't know, that seems to be increasingly true. We're never gonna fully lose the metaphor um, because you know, Git is the sort of lingua franca of version control for better and for worse. Um, and so like we'll never be able to not have we have a docs page right now that is like query for git users but like it's it could be twice as more it could be twice as detailed as it currently is and could be could really use like an update that's uh in my opinion um regardless i think people are going to compare us to git just no matter what because git is so both influential and pervasive um on the other hand like even people when they're familiar with git i think don't necessarily love Git because it has its own warts. And our strength is that we're able to be opinionated about ways that it should work and kind of like do things differently when um, we have the opportunity. And there's kind of like this balance that we're trying to do where we're familiar yet also improve upon some of those things, hopefully, um, which is always an interesting thing to hear people notice. Then just to try and bring this full circle, Ben, if, if you off the top of your head, one or two things that you would immediately think need the most attention um, based on your like recent use, I'd love to hear that. If you had like, if you could put them into a priority list. Sorry to put you on the spot, but if you can do it, great. If you can, feel free to pass. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it's, it, it's hard because I would say that I get from a, from a, a sense of like, telling someone else to use this platform, I would say the collaboration would be a big thing, but that's not necessarily something that I need, like in my, like since I've started freelancing, it's not something I need, it is, it would have been useful if I was to propose this in my, when I was working as in a team, um, but it's less of a, is less of a, um, an issue for me right at the moment. Um, a few, I guess it's more of a minor thing, um, but even just within searching for data sets, I think that 
I had brought up a point that when you're searching for some data sets, it seems like it showed the full history of commits with repeated file names for each. And I think that that was one thing where it's like, if I'm searching for, if I'm searching for Chris's turnstile data set, I just want the latest one. Um, which I mean, I think that you can't access that through the history. So that would make things a little bit clearer. I think that there's also a bit of a question about the, the sourcing on the data. Um, because I don't know if this is still the case, but when I looked, when I happened to look on the website and it had the featured data sets, um, it had World Bank, World Bank data, but it's always, it's not, in the context in which I was using data, like the having kind of an accurate, or having a lot of clarity around the source of the data is incredibly important. And so for even like with the World Bank data, there's a World Bank data set from someone by an account called B5, but I don't know what that is. So in a sense, like, do I, and even, and even to a degree with the, I would say with the, with the subway turnstile data, I think that there, there also has to be a little, there, you have to be a little bit careful with that because at, is that MTA? Because in reality, like, I, I don't know who is, I don't know if that's an account MTA is involved with or if that's just Chris uh, maintaining that data set. But um, with a lot of that stuff, it's, if you're gonna be pulling those data sets, I think that there has to be a lot of clarity around, uh, around the sources. And I think that was one of my, that actually just reminds me of one of my other comments, but aside from the, um, aside from the collaboration, I think that in the same, again, to draw the comparison to Git, where Git kind of has organizations in which you can have multiple contributors be part of, and that a repo can belong to that organization as opposed to individual contributors. I would say a lot of the cases in which I've seen data maintained is, and I think what, what partially makes the collaboration important, but also kind of that being able to attribute data to an organization and not just one person, it's just that there's usually so many people involved with the data set and also it gets handed off between different people. So in many cases, if I would say that long-term, if you wanted someone like, if you wanted a group like the MTA or even like a nonprofit like I worked for to use the system, I think it's incredibly useful that they would have some kind of structure in which you could maintain data by like an organ by some kind of entity that wasn't just tied to an individual because that's eventually it's it would eventually get passed along, or at least like the you would you wouldn't want the data to be tied up all with one per with one account um, potentially because it just it creates it can create problems in which like suddenly then you have multiple people using the same account to edit data. And then you might actually lose some of the the nuanced information about who made particular edits. So there's there's I think that there's some there's some decisions around that which, um, as the program evolves, can make it a lot more useful in at least in the context I saw being I saw data being used in in um, different organizations. I think that and then on top of that I would say there's also from more of a, I don't know if it's necessarily like a bigger, it's hard to say that this is a, this would be like a key need for the program. It kind of more depends on what, what the team's kind of outlook for what they want to do with what they really want to accomplish with query is. But um, I think that some, in my direct usage of it, some things that would be more interesting is, like I said, basically being able to connect more, more quickly to the data. Because at least when I'm, for what I'm using it for right now, um, I'm basically downloading a data set and instantly trying to like connect it into like a, like a D3 visualization. So there's some aspects of that where, in which when you're talking about can this function differently than, than Git or better than the way that Git functions, I don't know, I don't, this is where my, I'm um, not very much like a developer and don't have a great sense of how the, pro the program is functioning, but since the data is stored on query locally, does that give you, the, with some of like the, I don't know if this is how the CLI functionality works, but does that give me the ability to just plug in like a URL on my machine or in my code that could let me pull that data set directly out of query as though it's running like a server? I don't know if that's the case or not. Because similarly, one thing that would be, one thing that I see also potentially value in and something that like if you were to say like, 
what aspects would I pay for, I would pay to use query for. It's also then when you're working on those data visualizations, I feel like one challenge with, with doing visualization, visualization is always how do you host your data? And similarly, if you could have a, if you could have a streamlined process where, I think what I had asked about this before, there really wasn't necessarily an intent to have these data sets accessible directly online or kind of like a hosted data set that you could just link into. Um, but I think that if there was a way in which you could connect into those data sets to also power visualizations you were doing in a way that was better organized around like being able to pay like a fair cost for the amount of bandwidth that you might be using around the services. I mean, to me, that's always a big challenge. I mean, there, I think that's one, even when I look at things like I loved, I loved using Cardo for a very long time for different visualizations, but like suddenly now it's like the freelancing plan costs $150 a month. So it's, it's, it's kind of like out of my range for using, for using on a, on a regular basis for projects. But if there was something that I could reliably use as a data source for, for visualizations that, I don't know, say you had a data, say you could have a project that was running off of a GitHub page, but you wouldn't necessarily want to host the data there. You'd want to host it in a different way that you could use query to back up things like that. It would be, like I said, I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's a general like use case based off your, based off your business priorities, but at least just for my personal purposes, those are kind of like areas in which I could see it being very powerful, especially if it, especially if it prevented me from having to do like, have these different copies of data that I was pushing around and having to push to different platforms to actually power things. And that when you, if you fix, I mean, ultimately it's like, if you see an issue with the data set of something published, the idea that you can make a fix in one location, publish it, and then suddenly everything is just fixed. That's, that's the great outcome of having a system like this. So that's kind of, I guess, my summary. That's great. That's perfect. Um, yeah, lots, lots to talk about. The last one I think is, so I'm hearing just to read, to read back you the list. Uh, you gave me collaboration, showing multiple versions, search showing multiple versions being a problem. Attribution is a thing. We need teams and organizations. Uh, and being able to operate on the data in place is what I'm going to call the visualization stuff. Um, basically being able to say, cool, it's local. I should be able to talk to it over an API. We have some answers for that already. Um, and then a hosting some sort of like ideally like reasonable costs. So we're, we're outside of the range of 150 bucks is ridiculous. And so we're in, I'm like, I'm thinking like 10 to 15 a month for some sort of something, something GitHub style where I could just very quickly have easy peasy access to, to data in place. Feel like a summary of what you were saying? Yeah, and actually one thing I just thought of, which I forgot to mention was, I, cause right now I think like every time you, there's no, there's no ability for private data sets, right? At the moment, everything's public. Planned, not here yet. Okay. Cause that's the other thing I would say is like, especially with a lot of stuff I would potentially be working on. And I know for some of the, at least like with an organization, some of the data sets, it's like, at least not all of it is easily made public, at least past a certain point of being able to clean it up to a certain point and organize it to a certain point. So that's always kind of like a big consideration. Totally. And like sometimes your data just contains like personal information and you just, for reasons totally aside from open source like characteristics, you just can't disclose them. Um, so yeah, no, we're, we're definitely have plans for that. Um, in our world, we, we don't call it private data, we call it encrypted data. And it's, it's a whole thing <laughs> that we're hoping to work through. Um, Awesome. Awesome. That was really helpful. Thank you so much, Ben. I, I think we have a lot to digest there um, and a lot to sort of continue to talk through. I want to make sure that we have some other time to sort of voice any other questions on the call, but um, unless others want to sort of respond to anything Ben said, um, I know that I have a number of issues in debriefing to sort of make out of this because I want to do everything you said, Ben. I think it'd be, I think it'd be really nice to live all. We just get it all done. But time and bandwidth and blah, 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 something, something, something. We're all human. Anybody have any thoughts on that before we move on? Going once, going twice, told. Holger, how are you? 
Hi, fine. Thank you. Um, I played a bit with uh, Query this weekend, and uh, I had some some troubles. Uh, I, I wrote some issues. I think you saw them. Um, and I've got a couple of questions uh, on, on my mind. I, I think I, I wrote most of them in uh, in Discord. Um, so I still try to to understand a bit what's behind this going on behind the scenes. Um, I digged a bit into the code, not too much as I don't have much time for the moment. I wanted to understand how our types, column types uh, inferred. I did not find the, the, the correct place in the code. Don't know where it's done. Um, and I had a load data set issue. I wasn't capable, um, it gave me an error, report not found, not sure what happened there. Um, and what I'm, I'm thinking about, so one question is, for example, which kind of transforms should I do with star, with star log? Currently it's more or less very simple transforms. The, there are not too much, too many libraries for the moment. But for example, doing some kind of uh, spatial index uh, to to match features, spatial features, um, would that be something which will go into a star log library one day, or would that be kind of external uh, pre-processing and then doing the up, uploading manually? Um, that was a question. Um, another thing that, that bogs my mind is, is still handling large da data sets, uh, relational data sets like uh, GTFS, for example, and or um, the OpenStreetMap dump files, the PDF files, um, which, well, I I think don't match very well with with the kind of tabular data store which which. Uh, currently supports and but I, I think it would already be helpful to just have this binary blob somewhere and and share it using IPFS that would already be be great and and have a version attributed to this file which you can reference for um, for example as well if if you um, did use information from that data set, you combine it, you merge it with other data and store these references in, in the metadata. Um, another question I had was, how do I reference this? Uh, citations uh, was the place in the metadata which seemed appropriate, but currently um, I think it's, it's only for referencing links or, or publications, but not, not really um, data sets, yeah. Um, let me see what else did I have. Yeah, and, and another question: How is this uh, SQL stuff working? Is is uh, is there a local database? Do I import uh, the data into a local database? And if so, is it, is it just the last version or the, every version? Uh, how much data will? Or how much space will? It, Will I need for that? So um, I still feel unsure because I don't grasp the concepts behind. I, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And that's something as well, the, the Git, uh, I, I don't think that there must be a one-to-one -one match with Git commands, but uh, it's my first um, reference I, or the first um, model I, I refer to. I, I try to translate and to understand does it work like like Git? Um, it it's, doesn't matter if it, if, if it does not, but then I, I want to know where it does not match. Yeah, and and um, yeah, so that's currently on my mind. That's great. Does anybody want to tackle one of those other than me? So I'm not talking all the time. Um, I found it helpful to describe the query data store as a as a database. So if you're already familiar with Postgres database and you can add tables, you know, by creating a create table statement, um, you know, think of I guess a, a helpful analogy is that query uh, basically makes all those tables portable. 
Um, so when you're when you're pulling down a table from Greek Cloud, you're just saying, you know, I want this table that exists somewhere else to miraculously appear in my data set in my in my collection locally, um, which I can now join with other ones that I have locally. Um, but basically, you know, it, it picks it up and plops it right back down, and, and it brought all of its metadata and its column schemas with it. Um, so you don't have to write a, a create table statement. Um, so it's not really a SQL database under the hood. It's it's still file based, but um, we're we're able to do database like things once we have it all in one place. Um, so that even further sort of solidifies the analogy that when you want a file of it, you still have to do something. It's not you know it, it exists. It, it lives over here in the database. When you want it to be a file, you got to get it out of the database, and that's why you have to export. Um, so that means you know pulling down finding a data set online. Uh, and, and pulling it into your query repo is like basically copying the table, but there's still another step to actually get it to be a file. And that's a big differentiator between, it's actually like we're adding another step to the normal circumstance where you can just click download and you get a file, um, but we're adding value because you know it, it's not a file anymore. So we, like the, the whole point of query is so that it's not a file until you need it to be. The rest of the time it is actually a proper you know, database like collection of data that has schemas and types and, and rules and all that sort of stuff that you don't get with files. Is that helpful? I, to, just to sort of add to that a little bit, because um, I, I, I think it's a great, uh, you've really, uh, both Ben and Pilger, you have hit some of the, the, the challenges of what we're doing, right? It's, it's like Git, but it's got a database. And, and so we have this diagram up on our website in a couple of places that Chris is alluding to that it's like, the version control network in a database and we're kind of queries intending to be the Venn diagram between the three of them. Uh, and we really want in the long term for it to be one giant database where look quite literally where someone, one person creates a table in one place that is one thing and then someone else creates a table somewhere else and you're able to look at them both as if they're in the same database and you ask for that information, query just gets that for you, moves it to your local machine, performs the operations and then um, sort of like gives you back the answer. Where we've really struggled, uh, Holger, is where you sort of are getting at, particularly with the um, GTFS data, where you ha actually have 11 tables, and it, you know, when really that's kind of, a, is easier to express as a database itself, right? It's like, um, it's not, it, having them, we have this, we want the world to think of, of query as one giant database, but what you really want is some way to draw a box around these 11 things and say, this is one unit, right? Um, it, and stop me if any of this seems like we're getting off base. Um, and for us, we sort of started with this, this question of like, what is the sort of lowest, simplest abstraction we can sort of build around? And we, we thought that starting with a single a data set being tied to a single table is an, is an easier thing to get your head around of like, okay, there's going to be one table, you're going to write metadata around one thing, you're going to like transform, write transforms that'll sort of create a single table. Um, and for that, for, we sort of have a lot of work to do to get to the point where we can do uh, the thing that it sounds like you're really asking for, which is links, um, both your sort of binary blob of a giant amount of data and a sort of data set that is a composition of other data sets are both examples of like link resolution that we have to sort of mature into as the project moves forward. Link resolution is a hard thing to do properly. Um, and it sort of ties to your other question of like when, when I query in SQL over something, uh, give me one. My coworker is making a lot of noise. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> the, when you run an SQL query, you're actually querying the database, the data that's inside of query. We actually have an open question right now about whether if you have a checked out directory, should it run against that or should it run against the head? We like don't know which, what the right answer is there. Lots of opinions. Um, but at the end of the day, the way that data can't, for query to be able to move data around the way that Chris talked about, we have this immutability property, which is comes from IPFS. And that's what makes it possible to move everything around really easily. It also makes it a really difficult concept to explain, right? Uh, and it's, it also makes it, and that immutability property is shared with Git, and that's where the metaphors really make a lot of sense. But working out like a nice, clean way of explaining, oh yeah, it's like Git and NPM mashed together, where if you ask for a package in NPM, it's just gonna go get it for you at the latest version. And if you then turn off your internet and try to talk to it, you're gonna get the latest version, but somebody might publish a version some other time. There's like all of these 
idiosyncrasies that come from combining a network with a sort of localized version of that network. Um, and so there's a lot to be sort of explained here. But to try and answer your questions in order, um, when Starlark can totally do geospatial stuff, it's not, uh, it's not the only answer. And there are many situations where Starlark sort of like, uh, sort of hits a limit, but there is a geospatial package inside of Starlark that will do stuff. Um, generally, if the amount of data that you're processing is huge, we recommend sort of flipping it around and just tying query to the end of an existing data pipeline, as most folks do. Um, Starlark works really well when the thing to do is discrete and you want to make it something that is run fairly, fairly repeatedly. Because uh, the upside of Starlark is the actual script travels with the data set itself. And so you get this sort of update factor that moves with the data. Second question you had about links, just like binary blob data. We've been calling those attachments, and that's something that we very much want to tackle in the near future. Uh, we want the ability to version arbitrary data have and be able to link to that arbitrary data from within the body of a data set. I think it's really important. Uh, this The one we keep, the uh, use case that keeps coming up for this is doing uh, computer vision and machine learning, where you have lots and lots of image files that you want to be able to reference and have those move around as well. And you want to be able to version the inputs, that kind of stuff, and attaching certain sort of uh, features or parameter sets to an image file. Uh, we, it's an active area of research for us, um, and it's something that we do is on the roadmap, um, but it's definitely like a lot of work to sort of get that right. Um, hopefully that answers that bit. And then to answer the SQL question very uh, directly, right now when you get a data set, that data set is going to this internal database, as Chris said, and when you query it, it's querying from there. Um, so it's talking to an immutable, um, to, uh, the immutable versions of the data sets only, and loading those up from an internal data store. So you will get repo not found, if you try to query data that you don't have. And so right now you have to run query add the name of the data set before you can query it. Query Q-U-E-R-Y, not Q-R-I. Um, in we are actively transitioning this whole, we're actively working this entire thing. A, to move the language to be closer to Git. So the, we have active proposals right now that we're hopefully gonna talk about next around. Uh, pushing and pulling data sets, becoming the language for moving stuff around, and having all of that happen automatically. So when you run a query for a data set that you don't have, you query the program, figures out that you need it, figures out where it is, goes and gets the latest version. And if that version is too big, it should stop and ask you, say, hey, you're about to grab a gig of data. Do you want to do this? <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll run the query and give you the result. Dustin has a point. What we should really do in those cases, if I try and run SQL against something that's too big, it runs the SQL over there and then tells me the answer. We're a ways off from that happening, but something something we we can dream. Yeah, yeah something we dreamed about. Um, yeah, another thing that's important is like uh, you're talking about like the inner workings. Uh, we're not doing like a full uh, uh, production style SQL engine. Like we don't have um, super fast indexes now. Uh, it's currently using this uh, representation that's more around immutability and like the IPFS. Um, way of keeping data where it, it cares more about um, keeping things uh, historically linked and so forth. Um, so yeah, uh, it may not have the performance of like a uh, uh, super fast SQL, SQL engine. To try and sort of connect some dots here, Ben, you had some questions about citations. The hope with all of this is that we can have the citations start to write themselves. So if Holger writes a query that joins two tables, Ideally, those two tables authors are connected to the data sets themselves. Those data sets citation meta may cite data that's outside of query. And then you will immediately, without having to do anything, get a data set that says these two people contributed to this, this source information. Uh, this isn't collaboration that you talked about, but we think this is a foundation is a really important part. Uh, and you can see how eventually if we have multiple people being able to contribute to the same timeline of versions, uh, we can now say, well, there were 17 people involved in the creation of these two data sets, and all of them were in some way, in varying ways, involved in the actual uh, data. And so that's the world we're trying to move towards. Uh, it's a lot to figure out. <laughs> and then, as Dustin said, ideally it's happening on someone else's machine, and like the, some swarm of peers are doing it all. Um, yeah. Well, and also just one quick comment on the on this large data sets is just that I would say. I don't know, again, if this is another area in which you can kind of do something that's a little bit more unique, but um, I would say with, even when I've been interested in exploring some of the larger data sets, 
the ability to either preview what that data set looks like without necessarily having to download the entire thing and or if you had some ability to even download a sample like a smaller sample of certain data sets that you could actually test against because in many cases even if I was doing a, vis a visualization work around different data sets I want to test it on a smaller subset anyway before I would plug in like a full on or like download all several gigabytes of the data before um, um, and I don't know if that's something where it's, it might even be a, a, I don't know, you check out a, you automatically like create a copy and check out like some sample of it that if it was, I don't know, if it was, if it, I guess I could see where it could also be challenging if you're downloading that subset and making edits to it somehow. But um, I think also if you're, if you're providing this resource to get into a lot of data sets, things that make Absolutely. Um, case in point of that, right now, if you go to anything on query.cloud, those are all previews of data sets. Um, actually, on Query Cloud right now, everything is, also the full data set is stored behind the, behind the scenes. <laughs> Talk about a, a download button to come later. But uh, those, those previews can actually be generated by any peer on the network. Um, and so that has two uses where uh, when the data set is too large for cloud to hold it, say it's 200 terabytes and we're like, just we're not gonna hold on to that data set for you. Um, cloud can hold the preview. So you can download the first 100 rows or I think, yeah, are we currently first 100 rows? Yes, first 100 rows of a data set. Um, and so you could see that and get it without actually having to grab any of the principal data. And it, because we're also a peer-to-peer -peer network, we can say, we have the preview. This is how the data looks. The real data is over here. And if you want it, go get it from them. Um, and we can provide that for free, which I think is a fun, fun world to live in. Can't run SQL on that preview as it is right now, but that would also yield weird results. And so, I don't know. That's, that's a concern, sir. But you, I like where your head's at. We're headed exactly there. Awesome. Um, so we've got 15 minutes left. Um, we've got some questions happening in chat. I want to make sure that we're addressing some of these. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Yes, uh, and just to sort of say aloud what you mentioned in chat, Holger, uh, if you've run query init, you are the source of the data. And so uh, other people can't see it unless you've run query publish, um, but you are able to operate on it locally all you like. Uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, okay, so then I have to try again and give some. Sounds like a bug. Sounds like we've, we've given you a bug somehow. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, with that in mind, the, uh, speaking of the future, we've been talking a lot about what could be or what would be. Um, and so for this process, we have something called RFCs, which is our request for comments process. And that's right now we have we actually have eight of them open right now, um, which are all proposing changes to query um, as, it, as it exists right now. And the reason we um, bring up the RFCs is we often use these as the bridgings in between, hey, wouldn't it be nice if, and here's what we're going to do next. Um, and here's how it's going to look. And so, Ben, I'd, I'd really invite you to sort of take a look at some of the RFCs are actually at a point where they're now finished and ready to sort of like review from people who are outside of, of uh, the sort of like people who are writing and participating in the, in the creation of these. Uh, you might also get involved and be like, eh, this is really technical and I'll just wait for you guys to solve this. Um, but you can see how some of that language is shaking out. We're really, uh, with the next release of query we're preparing for, we're calling the back end is going to be query zero, version zero, ten, zero. Um, will be this big overhaul of a number of things. Uh, hopefully it will align a lot of expectations. Things that we should be seeing that will work much more cleanly are um, the language should be really sort of aligned. Um, ideally, it'll be better language and a little bit easier to grok what's going on. Uh, we are stealing from Git more in this where we're using words like push and pull and drop action verbs for like moving data around and asking people to get rid of data. Um, we're also sort of like starting to uh, sketch out some new commands around access which is access becomes the foundation for collaboration in a closed setting. Being able to say, I want to create a closed data set and I only want to give access to these people. Um, that's that's uh, in the near term sort of set of work. And we're also doing a whole bunch of work to sort of revise the way the transforms work. Um, we're trying to really understand, we've, we've had a number of folks show up with Starlark code. Transforms, just for the record, uh, are a way of automate the creation, automating the creation of data set with Python code. Uh, so you can write scripts that sort of like tell a data set how to update itself. Uh, Dustin has been pioneering a much better interpretation of how all of this fits together, and uh, we should be seeing some of that land as well uh, in the next little while. 
Uh, that'll come with the notion of a, a new phrase we're calling apply, uh, which allows you to sort of apply scripts to data sets. One of the other things that is proposed is the thing that you can apply to data sets is a visualization. And so the uh, idea there being, I can submit a template, query will take the data that I'm trying to run that template against, and, uh, X, and that template will include like classic, uh, I don't know if you've worked with other templating languages like um, handlebars or mustache or uh, ERB templates are another example, but basically a language you can put little strings in and says, put the data here. Um, and then I have a D3 chart somewhere else. Uh, and apply will be able to run those as well. We currently have all this in the command line side under sort of viz, but this will help us sort of generalize that set of concepts and would get us closer to an API that would let you just apply stuff on the fly. So yeah, does anybody, I mean, I feel like we've had a really rich discussion here and I don't really know how to like bring up a topic around RFCs that is discreet enough to fit into 10 minutes um, that would kind of like uh, in any way compete with the value of the discussion here. So what I guess I would love to sort of table instead is a conversation around direct downloading of links on Query Cloud, which is something that we had at the earliest couldn't start until next week, which is when we're gonna start a sprint around cloud. But I'd love to just sort of take the temperature or the room. On Discord, there's a really rich conversation happening about whether or not we should be just doing this. Um, uh, Rusty, you had some points for, I'm really inclined to agree. But I'd just like to know what others think about it and how we could sort of sort through some of the idiosyncrasies around like what's too big, what's too much, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, love to just get thoughts, others' thoughts and open the floor up for, should we just have direct downloads on cloud? I'll just say uh, my point of view is obvious on this one, and I don't think I have anything to add. Yeah, from a business user growth perspective, I think one of the early discussions we had was, hey, if you want the data, you got to come all the way to query and download our awesome app and be our best friends before you can get it. And I think we can probably in introduce that friction when we're maybe a little bit further along in terms of users, but this might be a really good way to just get more people to interact and, and not fall through the filter right away. I think you have to think of a read-only user versus a data publisher. And if you think of those two people, completely different people, then I think your perspective might change. Um, you know, just public, public, uh, what's Jupiter, public Jupiter notebooks, um, any number of things you could wind up doing with read only that somebody who didn't care to understand how query desktop worked, didn't want to use the command line thing, and is never going to publish, they're not going to need to use query at all. But your point, Rusty, is they're like actually contributors in the sense that they're helping reinforce the usefulness of data inside of this thing. Right. If they're read only, what are they ever going to do with query desktop? Or whatever. I mean, what can they add? I guess they can start publishing visualizations within Query. Um, but past that, I you know, there could be a user that never never publishes at all, and you're you're losing them if the onboarding is too complicated. Yeah, and I think I, I mentioned this in chat, but I think there's like also a, a way to sort of broaden. We at our broadest level, what we're trying to do is increase access to data for regular people, right? Regular people being anybody. Um, and this is a way to do that. <laughs> and so like forgetting, forgetting like, not forgetting the business, but like putting the sort of like the goal of the project first and the goal of the business second. The goal of the project is to sort of make sure that we're getting increased access. We can figure out how to trap a business model to that um, or put restrictions on that that prevent people from abusing um, service, but like, Ben joined the call today and asked about like, hey, could I be able to just link and reference this in other places? Chris? Um, I'll like, think back to my time working in city government where I, I was kind of a pioneer for using GitHub for managing code, um, which of course is good, you know, not just for the 
intricacies of actually managing code, but also for like discussion around features and, pro and, and improvement of all that sort of stuff. And basically where I'm going with this is that there are a lot of people in our organization who are absolutely not um, code producers who are still willing to engage if we would just push them over that hump. Um, and I think we can draw a bit of an analog there of there are probably plenty of people who would be willing to create a comment um, and give some feedback and, you know, give back to the community if they were allowed to via a, a comment thread to say, watch out, I found this weird thing about this column or I found some duplicates, the kind of stuff that's happening on Twitter right now. Uh, like for example, this person, this person, you know, found duplicate rows in the bike bridge counts data set, which I had analyzed three months ago. Um, I was able to get back in touch with the people that produce that data because I know a lot of people in New York City government, this person does not. Um, and, you know, I can nudge him that way, but like, be nice if I could just drop a link and be like, you need to tell these people that this is happening right now in a public forum, you know, in, in basically an issue queue. Um, so, I, yeah, in that respect, I think there are still absolutely ways that we can, you know, get users and get signups uh, without necessarily forcing the, you must, you must run a local IPFS node and be able to pull down full data sets. Um, there's, there's plenty more ability to participate in the community without actually like pulling down full query data sets. Well, also, also I would say just to add on to that, I think that with the, um, even if you're a read only user that having that notification of the history of changes is incredibly useful. Um, just because even when I've, even when I've interacted with a lot of data sets, even just on a read only basis, even if I can just download those from different things like New York City's open data portal. Sometimes that, if you look at the date, the information around when data was last updated may or may not be very helpful in terms of did anything about this data actually change or was there some stray metadata attribute that was edited? And even though this data says that it was updated a month ago, the data itself hasn't been updated for two years. Um, so I think that there, that's one, that's one thing where I would say that there is a tremendous amount of value. Like, say for example, even just the um, going back to just because I've been looking at this turnstile data that Chris has been publishing, like every every periodically he's up, he's been updating the data set with with new values. Now, if you're if you're talking about an older an older data set, in which case there's not going to be a lot of as many subsequent changes. Maybe it's not as important, but the idea that if I could be if I could have a system in which I could am connected to that data, and if I revisit it a month later and there's been new data that's been added, and I can just one button we pull that data and have an updated data set on my computer to work with. That there's a tremendous amount of value in that. And kind of like understanding what those and having and I, one of the biggest benefits compared to a lot of other platforms is just having more information about what those changes are. I'm sold. <laughs> if you, you go ahead. Um, sorry, Rico. Um, another along Chris's point, um, think of how many people, and I have no idea how to estimate it, but. I guess you can run a query on it. Think how many people have a GitHub account and have never written a single line of code. So they're essentially a read-only user, but they want to file an issue or comment on an issue. And once you get issues or conversations or whatever in place on query, a lot of those read-only users will set up an account just to use query.cloud and, and comment on a data set. This is delightful. Yeah, I think this is a really good reason to start planning. So we'll talk, we'll have to talk about this game internally, but like, I'm, this sounds really great. I, th I think the cascade from, you know, being able to use this uh, just as a zip file, being able to do this as an API thing uh, and transitioning that. I like this idea that we started with modeling a read on the user and have ended with like, well, no, they're much more than that. They're just a gateway to, they're, they're uh, sitting on a potential and one of those things is just being able to tell somebody, hey, this is out of whack. That's a massive contribution. And like that's, we live and die on those. Holger, you fi you're filing those issues right now and like we us know what's broken and how, what priority to fix it is the only way we can organize our work. 
And so like, yeah, this is great. And I mean, Ben, as, as you're saying, being able to sort of just say, if the only benefit you provide on query is you can see exactly what changed since the last time you looked at this data, I think that's actually pretty earth shattering when it comes to data. Also, no, I was just going to say, Go also ahead. going back to just the straight, to just downloading, there's, I work with, I work with, I, well, I do a lot of mapping work and so I work with some of the geographic files from like New York City's open data. And yes, I can just download a lot of those data sets directly from the portal. And so I have like a series of zip files, but what I'm, if I'm revisiting a project several months later, there's not really a great way to say like, okay, is that file that I downloaded five months ago still up to date, is still the most up to date? So I can just reuse what I've done already, or do I have to re-download that the current data set and go through whatever processing I might have done to connect that or to kind of root that back into whatever visualization or piece of work I've done with it? Versus if I can if I if I had a system in which I was already linked to that data and can see like, oh, has any change been made on this in the last or what changes have been made in the last five months, then even as a read-only user, there's a tremendous amount of value in that, just from even just a time saving. Yeah, a meaningful answer to what changed. Cool, Rusty, you can have the last word. And then after this, I think we should take a break because I have two minutes to the hour. Just to get to the, Chris's other point of, you know, using GitHub for stuff and, and drawing other people in. If a data source, had a read-only data viz user use it and in that office they saw query.io data sources pop up over and over again they might publish there and then at that point bring in their read-only user to collaborate with them on mm -hmm. deep agree well thank you everybody for such a lovely discussion i feel like we've achieves purpose and clarity and I have a lot of, I feel like I have a lot of direction on what to do next. Um, yeah. Uh, until next time we have a call on Friday, uh, which we'll be talking about everything that we've accomplished this week. Mainly what we did this sprint was write spec and uh, fixed a lot of bugs. And so uh, JSON schema is going to be a lot faster soon. That's going to be cool. Uh, thanks. That's <laughs> and, and we have a whole bunch of command cleanup that's going to come through. Thanks to a bunch of work from others. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you'd like to join Friday to find out how what we've done in the last two weeks, that's uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, or just Eastern Time right now. But, uh, other than that, thank you so much for joining everybody, and we'll see you on the internet. Olga, Ben, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thanks.